हम हरे हरे हम कृष्णा कृष्णा नित्य गौर थाय घोर हरे भरे भाव हरे भोर हरे भोर एक जाय जाय प्रभु प्रभु भार है प्रभु भान जाय प्रभु भान ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाशनल सर्विस भक्ति योग uh in this first verse in the 12th chapter krishna arjun asks a question hmm evam satata yukta ye bhakti bhaktas tvam payupasate ye japyak saksaram vyagyaktam teshum ke yoga vitamaha arjuna inquires which are considered to be more perfect those who are always properly engaged in your devotional service or those who worship the impersonal brahman the unmanifested mm -hmm. supreme personality of god had says those who fix their minds on my personal form they're always engaged in worship me with great and transcendental faith are considered to be by me to be most perfect so in those two the questions and answers gets right to the essential point there are ways to approach the supreme lord through the personal aspect of devotion or through the impersonal aspect through meditation and various forms of austerities and penances um the absolute truth is mentioned in the and the um shrimad bhagavatam vadanti tat tat vad vidvyam stad vagya gyanam avayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan eti subjate so the absolute truth is one but there's three features of the oneness uh impersonal brahman realization or understanding the all pervading spiritual energy that that is everywhere in existence and then you have the paramatma or the lord within the heart they call that the localized aspect of the lord or the lord situated in the heart of all living entities paramatma antaryami and then you have the bhagavan feature of the lord which is the personal feature of the lord in his transcendental form as krishna or in any of the other manifestation of the personal forms of the lord So these three aspects all make up the one you know we have to emphasize absolute truth the absolute truth cannot be divided but there are aspects of the absolute truth just like if you look at a mountain you might be looking at the mountain from one angle and someone else is looking at the mountain from an, an opposite angle and another person from another angle so each is seeing the same mountain but one sees different things according to what's on what's what's in their purview so in the same way the absolute truth is one but it can be realized in three levels of itself and so arjun is posing the question the realization of brahman is that better or is you as the bhagavan feature is that more perfect what is more perfect he doesn't say better or worse 
uh, he says what is more perfect so um, if you know a person and you also know about their activities and you also know about what they possess you might see the person in these three aspects well these are his possessions this is his activities and this is him so the relationship you can't really have much of a relationship with the person's possessions and you may have some relationship with his activities but the real relationship was with this with the person's itself real means complete so when you know the person and you're intimate with the person then that is that is the complete relationship with the person which includes their activities and the, the possessions they they also have so using that analogy you see that the energy of the Lord is the all-pervading Brahman effulgence and it permeates throughout of all the universe it's compared to the sunshine you can also use the same analogy which is one the analogy that's used by the acharyas a lot you have the sun god you have the sun globe and you have the sun shine the shine is everywhere the globe is localized and the and the sun god is the source of both the the globe and the uh, energy. So in the same way Krishna is the manifestation of the complete Godhead and he appears in his localized form in the hearts of all living entities. That's called unto Yama, Paramatma, Super Soul. But he is also there in his energy as the all spiritual existence. Like nothing, nothing in this world can move without a touch of the spiritual energy. Everything, all, all material energy is dead. It's called jada. It has no life as itself. Just like this desk here. It was once formed part of a tree. When it was connected to the tree, it actually had life. And now since it's disconnected from its life force, it's, it doesn't have any life as itself. It's just what it is, a piece of wood formed in a certain way like that. So in the same way, the energy of the Lord, people want to realize God through his energy. Or that spirit pervades everything and matter is simply subordinate to spirit. Therefore, let us connect with that spiritual energy and raise our consciousness to the all-pervading aspect of God's energy, the spiritual and which means to merge into the energy of the Lord. It's like if you stand in the sunlight, doesn't mean you're in the sun. But you're in the sun also. Because the sun and the sunlight can never be separated. But the sun and the sunlight is not the same. If you say the sun is in my room, the sun is not in your room. If it was, there would be no room and you wouldn't be there either. <laughs> So we use that term, what does it mean is the energy of the sun called sunshine is everywhere. And, that, and we experience the sun in that way. We experience it through his energy. But then there are beings who live on the sun. They have fiery bodies. And they have, their bodies are made out of fire. And they live nicely on the sun just like the humans live nicely on the earth. Because we have earthly bodies. This is called earth planet, so we're earthlings. And then there, there's animals that live in the water. They're called fish. Their bodies are adapted where water becomes their natural environment. When you try to live in the water, you need all kinds of you know, equipment to, to stay alive. <laughs> and you can't do that very long either. If you try to live in the air, the birds can do that, but you can't. You can't stay up there. After, after some time, you go crazy and you want to come down. <laughs> because we're earthlings. And so there are beings that are connected with the different elements on different realms of uh, material existence. But the energy that, that is giving life to everything is spiritual. And that energy is coming in, in the form of the all-pervading spiritual energy of the Lord. We are like that also. So
so to realize God completely, realize means the source of everything that's in existence and not just the existence itself. If you say, um, if you say, I'm in the bathroom, that means I'm in the house. <laughs> yeah, you are in the house, but you're still in this particular section of the house. But you're not, you can't say that I'm in the house in the sense that, you know, every room in the house is the same. <laughs> it's different. So in the same way, there's different categories of existence, which are the all-pervading energy of the Lord. But then there is the source of it all, and that is Krishna. Or Krishna says, I am the source of everything material and spiritual. The wise who know this engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. So he is the manifestation of all the energies. So in answer to Arjuna's question, Krishna says ultimately, one who is engaged in my devotional service connects with me and they also connect with my energy automatically because when you get the person you get the energy also but if you simply go for the energy that's all you get you don't get the person the person is separated from the energy because the way to realize the person is not the same way to realize the energy it's a different process and so bhakti is the highest so we see in the Damodar prayers, um, Satyavat Muni, in prayer number three, and especially in prayer number three and four, he says, uh, I don't, you know, I don't want liberation. I don't want residence in the Vaikuntha realm, nor do I want any other boon. I simply want that vision of Balagopal to be situated in my mind. So he's rejecting all other forms of spiritual attainment, going for the complete attainment of Krishna in his personal form, in his leelas in Vrindavan, in, in especially his Bal Leela as a little boy who is engaged in mischief. So he's going for the essence of the essence of the essence. So do you see the connection where there are different levels of bhaktas who want different aspects or realizations of the Lord in different forms like that. And so um, there's devotees who aspire to go back home, back to Godhead. He doesn't even want that. He simply wants that vision of Balagopal to be in his mind always. And this is his mood of devotion. And he says, what is the use of any other boon? Hundred, hundreds and hundreds of uh, other, you know, boons are simply useless. And he says, I don't want any other boon. That means whatever else in existence could be given, he doesn't even want that. So in his prayer, the Damodar, he is he's coming to the highest form of bhakti, the loving aspect of Krishna in Vrindavan in his mood as a little child uh, engaging in stealing butter. <laughs> he said, that's all I want. Now that's that's very intimate, that's very personal, and that is the manifestation of the, the highest form of devotion because it relates to the personal form of the Lord. He, that relates to the personal form of the Lord. So there are different types of spiritualists who engage in devotional service. It's like many devotees come to Krishna consciousness for some spiritual elevation. And then they have different ideas. What is spiritual elevation? What do you have? To, what is it? So some devotees gather a lot of philosophical knowledge and thinking by gaining more and more philosophical knowledge, you know, I'm becoming more and more advanced. Others like to do a lot of service and they think by doing more and more service, I become more and more advanced. But then there's those who actually are attracted to the personality of God and see Krishna himself. Of course, through knowledge and through activities, you can develop that attraction. But then there's for those who are spontaneously attracted to Krishna and want to serve Krishna, just like a person in this material world who loves someone and wants to serve them, to please them in different ways. 
So when we come to Krishna consciousness, we come with different ideas and different goals. But then when we learn what is the highest and what is the recommended way is that to develop one's love for Krishna through serving Krishna with a desire to please Krishna. And it doesn't really matter what service I do. The service is secondary. The desire to please Krishna is foremost. And that becomes the focus of the devotee, just to please Krishna. And by pleasing Krishna, then that is the perfection of devotional service. Because when Krishna is pleased, his energy of being pleased flows out not only to the person who pleases them, but to everyone who's connected with that person. And everything in existence. Just like they say that if Krishna is pleased, the whole world benefits. The one who pleases them is benefited directly, but indirectly, even those who are not connected to Krishna in devotional service, if someone pleases Krishna, they get some benefit from that. Their benefit may be aligned with whatever their material desires are, just like if they have some material desire, then maybe they get a better chance to fulfill that material desire. So the please Krishna is the highest form of devotional service. And and what does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita and in the ninth chapter? He says, Patram Pushram Falam Tayam, Yomi Bhakta Panasyati Taraham Bhakta Upavitam Asnami Payatatmanaha. So he talks about pleasing him is simply done by devotion to him or love for him. So it, 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 therefore bhakti is really easy. <laughs> simply try to serve Krishna in a way that will please Krishna. To get an understanding how to please Krishna, it comes through the instructions of the spiritual master who teaches the science of bhakti in a practical way and engages the, the disciple in a way that they can execute their service in such a way that it will be pleasing to Krishna. <laughs> pleasing to Krishna. All, all devotional service is absolute. Krishna doesn't see one service better than other. But sometimes there is a distinction made. There's only one distinction, and I'll, make, I'll mention that later. Um, but in, from the absolute point of view, devotional service is all the same. In other words, in other words, if someone is out uh, distributing books, but is trying to make money so they can buy a new car, <laughs> so they may think, I'm distributing books, just see how wonderful it is. But their motivation is to get some extra money to get something for themselves. And someone is in, some person is just scrubbing some pots in the back, but they're thinking, these are Krishna's pots, and I want to make them nice and clean for the devotees to cook in. And this will make this will make everything very nice. So they put their time, energy, and their devotion into making it as nice as possible. That's superior to a person who may be doing a, a somewhat superior form of devotional service. Now that's not a, a real statement, because devotional service is not inferior, superior. It, it's all connected to Krishna in the sense that what pleases Krishna is superior, and what doesn't is inferior. <laughs> That's the criteria, not so much the service itself. But there is one distinction, and, and that distinction is that those who preach Krishna consciousness, they get special mercy. Mm. Because Krishna comes to the material world simply to inspire people to take up devotion to him. So anyone who does that, in other words, they are directly connected with Krishna's internal desire to bring more and more souls to him, then that there is a special mercy that's there. And if they're doing it to please Krishna, then it's, then it's you might not say it's superior, but it's, it's more recommended service. <laughs> it's the service that gets what we say, quicker recognition from Krishna. <laughs> and those who spread Krishna consciousness, that, that doesn't mean the person who sits and gives classes, it means anyone who makes an active conscious effort to bring others to Krishna conscious. They could be a temple manager, they could be a painter who is painting uh, pictures of the spiritual world, they could be anyone 
as long as they're doing their service in the mood of attracting others to devotional service and trying to bring others. It doesn't have to be a particular type of service, but it's the mood of reaching out and bringing others in. But uh, that's the only distinction. But devotional service is absolute. Like that. And you see, you have different types of devotees. You have, you have Krishna bhaktas, you have Vishnu bhaktas, you have Narayan bhaktas, and in the category of Narayan, you have Nishringa Bhaktas, you have Ram Bhaktas, and then you have Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Bhaktas, which are <laughs> Gore Bhaktas. There, there are, they're actually Krishna Bhaktas, but they're manifested in focusing on Gaur Garanga Mahaprabhu's mission of Krishna consciousness. So there's different types of Bhaktas. Um, there's Shiva Bhaktas, but that's not devotional service. <laughs> that's something else. <laughs> uh, Shiva is a devotee of the Lord, and those who worship Shiva, what does he do? He brings them to Krishna. <laughs> Krishna Shiva is not interested in gaining followers for himself. There are a large Shiva does have a large group of followers, but that's in his role as a demigod. But as a, as his role of a devotee then he inspires people to come to Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you'll see many devotees who've come to Krishna consciousness were Shiva Bhaktas before then. <laughs> I used to carry my little sh button of Lord Shiva when I first joined the Hare Krishna movement. Because I used to worship Lord Shiva before I came. And I know many devotees who also used to worship Lord Shiva in different ways. Of course, not by smoking ganja. That's not your way. <laughs> that's not the way to worship Lord Shiva. It's about. It's more like like uh, you pray to Shiva so he can somehow or other give you devotion to Krishna. <laughs> that is the best way to worship Lord Shiva. So you see, there's different types of bhaktas, uh, but our movement is centered around Krishna bhakta or Gore Bhakta, either one. These are the two. Um, we also worship Lord Ramachandra, and we also worship uh, you know, many of the Leela avatars, but actually our focus is on Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham. That is our focus because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is conducting the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, and he is the foundation for all of the teachings that we practice in Krishna consciousness. He's bringing us to the mood of Vrindavan worshiping Krishna and Radharani and Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham. So this prayer by, uh, by uh, Satyavrat Muni is really in the mood of deep bhakti to Krishna in Vrindavan as Baal Gopal. His, his, he's, a, he's a little boy, a little baby, and he is simply the Supreme Personality of Godhead causing various types of happiness to the residents of Vrindavan by acting as a naughty child, a sweet child, a lovable child, so many different ways. And this endears the, the residents of Vrindavan to Krishna even more and more and more. So the more we hear about it and the more we enter into the mood of devotion, that's why these prayers not only when we sing the prayers every night, we also we also recite the translations as a part, as a very integral part of the whole thing to get a deeper understanding of what is being under practice in this devotional service. And you'll see, it's um, Satyavrat Muni in practically every verse. He simply rejects everything, but loving devotion to him to to Krishna and Balagopal like that. Now here we mentioned a little bit about the impersonal aspect of the Lord. Those who take up, up that are, are in the majority. Actually, people who worship the Supreme Lord and his impersonal feature are the majority of the worshipers. Very few who worship Krishna in his form as Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham. They're, they're, they're in the minorities. Why? Because um, there's more strictness in the execution of devotional service as opposed to impersonalism. 
and therefore in order to avoid that strictness and also they also think that the impersonal aspect and the personal aspect are the same and it is they're true it's true it actually mentions it in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna mentions that in one verse let me see if I can find it that impersonal and personal are actually the same there's no difference so you might say well why are we making a distinction hmm He says, practically speaking, there is no conflict between personalism and impersonalism. One who knows God knows that the impersonal conception and the personal conception are simultaneously present in everything and that there is no contradiction. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya established his sublime doctrine, Achintya Beta Beta Tattva, simultaneously one and different. So Prabhupada is emphasizing this verse here. The verse is, Krishna says, Rasoham apsakuntaya pavasmi sasti suryaya pranava varade shu sabdike purusham nishu. I am the taste of water. I am the light of the sun and the moon. The syllable om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound and ether and the ability in all living beings. <laughs> so Krishna says, yeah, so Prabhupada says, if you taste water, and if you think that taste of water is Krishna, that's Krishna consciousness. So that you're becoming Krishna consciousness through the impersonal aspects of Krishna. And therefore he says you can't separate impersonalism from personalism. But then there's a class of people who do that and are not interested in the personal aspect. And they use the personal aspect as a means to come to the impersonal realization thinking that the impersonal is simply a creation in order for sadhana to, to exist. In other words, you have to have form in order to worship, but ultimately beyond the form is the reality. <laughs> and they have so many arguments. Therefore, if you hear the arguments of the impersonalism, especially the Mayavadi impersonalism, you'll become damaged in your Krishna consciousness. Your mind will become disturbed and you'll become confused because their, their, their logic is very, very hard to defeat. But when you, unless you hear from the Acharya, especially Srila Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya, you can see the difference. That of the two, of course it says simultaneously both are present in everything, but because we are personal, we have to relate to everything in the same way. You can't love something that is the and you can't love the energy, but you can love the energetic. But when you when you approach the energy, you also get the I mean when you approach the energetic, you also get the energy. But when you approach the energy, only when you connect the energy with the energetic, then you then you can then as it says here. It's like if you say, well, this taste of water is Krishna, and then you're remembering Krishna, that's Krishna consciousness. But you can't wash or worship the water as Krishna. <laughs> you can't worship that. That's pantheism, that everything is God. And therefore, and whatever we worship, tata, yatabha, tatapat, it's all the same. It doesn't matter. You worship, I worship, we worship this, we worship that, you worship, you know... Uh, you can just think of anything and then they put it in the category of you know acceptable worship but that doesn't work because because we are personal and we are coming from a person the relationship is with the person itself you can't uh, just like anything that has qualities that has attributes that has activities indicates personality Energies don't have qual they have some attributes, but they don't have activities. So therefore, when you speak of love, you have to speak of a person. When you speak of 
compassion, you speak of a person. When you speak of uh, activities, you speak of a person. So therefore, personalism is the complete and perfect expression of, of our relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that's what Satyavrat Muni is saying in this. I don't want to know anything, but your personal form is Balagopal and Vrindavan. That's all. <laughs> don't give me liberation. Don't give me any other benefit. Don't even take me to the spiritual world. <laughs> I just want to see that vision in my mind all the time, constantly. That's love. <laughs> Okay, so these are some things we can think about. This this topic is very extensive. The difference between personal and the impersonal. Lord Chaitanya tolerated all the discussions directed towards him, or all of the philosophy directed towards him, by Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. When Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was trying to teach Lord Chaitanya Vedanta Sutra, but he was doing it from an impersonal angle of vision. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was known as the greatest Vaishnava scholar in the area at the time. He didn't recognize Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He saw him as a great sannyasi who was very powerful. And he was thinking, he is taking, you know, he's taking initiation from, the, from Ishwara Puri, so I should teach him higher principles of Vedanta Sutra. And so for seven days he started to speak the Vedanta Sutra according to his understanding to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu silently, very obediently listened for seven days. After seven days, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was a little curious and he asked the Mahaprabhu, you know, you're sitting there, you're listening, I can see that, but you're not, you're not asking any questions, you're not, is everything okay, do you understand everything? But Mahaprabhu said, as far as Vedanta Sutra is, it's like the sun. When the Vedanta Sutra is out, the sun is out. But your interpretations or your explanations are clouds over the sun. <laughs> Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya almost fell off his chair, you know. <laughs> after here, after listening from seven days, Lord Chaitanya just said, everything you said is completely useless. <laughs> <laughs> Mahaprabhu was respectful because he was elderly and he was senior in that sense and he was respe respectable but Mahaprabhu was also using that as a way to convert Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and then uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya became a little bit you know disturbed by that and he said oh okay let me hear your interpretation and then Lord Chaitanya spoke and that's the uh, seventh chapter or sixth or seventh chapter of Madhya Lila where the Lord just shows the difference between personalism and impersonalism and ultimately says that personalism is higher because it, it deals directly with the source and not with the energy only it, that it directs our attention towards loving relationship with the personality of Godhead Srila Prabhupada in his writings they did a little calculation how many times Prabhupada said Supreme Personality of Godhead. It was 8,000 times <laughs> in his lectures and his writing. He always said, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Did you get it? <laughs> and then one time he challenged all the devotees. He said, Krishna is the well, he said, do you believe that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead? And why, and why do you believe that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead? And then he asked the devotees to give reasons why they believe that. And one devotee said, because you said so, Prabhupada. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, no. <laughs> I forgot the answer. <laughs> So many devotees gave different reasons why they understood that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. But I think because he is, mani he is manifested in that form and worshipped in that form throughout the world, and throughout the universe, actually. So 
but yeah, he is the supreme personality of Godhead. So that, and to approach that, that is, there's only way, bhaktiyamama vijananti, yavanyas tatpitatpataha. Only by devotional service can Krishna be known. So love is a natural proclivity of the living entity. To love is to, is to perfect life. Those who have love are happy, and love means to receive love and to give love. So when we develop that with Krishna, then we develop it with everyone, because Krishna is the source of everyone. You can't love everyone and not love Krishna. It's not possible, because then you're, you're, you're more like trying to uh, disconnect the parts from the source. The source is the basis of everything that the parts exist of. So when we develop our relationships with Krishna, in devotion we also develop our relationships with others. Mm -hmm. And when we try to do it on separate, it becomes mere material or what we say, selfish. <laughs> yeah. Then relationships become selfish when they're not connected to Krishna. When they're connected to Krishna, then they're selfless. And then the mood of service becomes the the, the medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. Serve for the sake of service. That's bhakti. <laughs> Not serve for what I can get from it. <laughs> like I was motivated today to come to the class today. So I could get out of the house. <laughs> so that's not really pure motivation, is it? <laughs> But then after a while, I started to think, hmm, yeah, it would be nice to be with the devotees and chant and speak some philosophy. <laughs> and maybe somebody will benefit, so I'll, I think I'll go. But I'm still getting out of the house. <laughs> so I wasn't so purely motivated. <laughs> But then again, I remembered Anasuya, and she said, come, so that made the difference. <laughs> so if there's any indecision, it was easily overcome by remembering Anasuya's command. <laughs> come, <laughs> all right. If I said no, then I would have, some have to have some excuses. <laughs> and I couldn't come up with any good excuses, so. <laughs> so we're not, we may not be pure in our motivations, but if we stay in bhakti and continue to chant the holy names of the Lord and try to serve the Vaishnavas, we'll develop that mood of, of activities that are free from personal motivation. Personal motivation means prescribed motivations. Everyone gets something, even those who serve selflessly are benefiting in themselves because that's the nature of the soul. The soul by nature becomes happy when it serves selflessly. So we are motivated for something even though we may be free from motivation because the benefit is there anyway. Although the motivation may not be there, still the benefit comes automatically because that's our nature. Our nature is to serve. We can't get away from that. And then when it's directed towards Krishna and it's done for the pleasure of Krishna, it's perfect. We have to serve our friends, our families, the government, <laughs> the doctors, <laughs> the tax collectors. <laughs> we have to serve. And Prabhupada said, if someone is not serving, Anyone he's serving, he's got a pet dog there. <laughs> that's his. That's his object of service, or some something. Everyone has to serve. Can uh, so when it's directed towards Krishna, then it 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 brings about the happiness the living entity is looking for. All right, Krishna. <laughs> Any questions or comments?
Did you believe everything I said? That's a problem. <laughs> you have to find those things that I didn't I didn't correctly say and then you challenge me there. Come on. Most of the lecture was like that. I was just <laughs> Okay. Questions? Comments? Criticisms? Disclaimers? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for such a nice class. Maharaj, um, as you were speaking about devotional service and um, touching on the verse, uh, two, three verses in the Dhamdarasakam, and we know the pastime of Lord in, I mean, of Krishna and Mother Yashoda, we know that there was always two ancient short. And one of it is, an, is, is our effort, our enthusiasm. Marsh, can you speak and share more of how, how is enthusiasm such a critical part in Krishna consciousness? It's, it's, the, it's the springboard for all activities. And Srupa Goswami says, Utsahan nishtaya darya tat tat karma pravartana. Utsahan is the first thing he says. Utsahan means enthusiasm. But then again, he describes what is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm doesn't mean you run as fast as you can from one place to another doing something. <laughs> Waving your arms up in the air. Look how enthusiasm I am. Mm more like that's causing a commotion. <laughs> Enthusiasm, as Rupa Goswami explains, and it's very scientifically understood, it means to endeavor with intelligence. To perform the activity using your intelligence. That means in the best possible way. That's enthusiasm. So it's not necessarily an external show of a, of emotion or activity. It's a consciousness of trying to perform the activity in the best possible way using as much intelligence as you can gain from, from guru, from sadhu, from shastra, from Krishna. That's enthusiasm. And by enthusiasm, you face the next problem, which is determination. When your enthusiasm somehow comes up against some obstacle, then he says, then you have to practice determination. Okay, Pariksha Prabhu, if you would like to ask a question. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Did you define uh, what Goswami is saying? Um, to endeavor with intelligence. With right. Knowledge. Um, so it's two parts, endeavoring and then of course the intelligence has to be there too. There is also a part in the in nectar of instruction that says that's bad, over that endeavoring, over endeavoring. Over endeavor? Yeah, and so endeavor with intelligence and over endeavoring, can you speak to this? Sometimes we're doing service, we want to do service, and we want to endeavor to do the service, and of course, uh, then well, sometimes obstacles come, and so it gets to a point where should you go on? Am I over endeavoring? Was you know, that's that? And I've reached that stage sometimes. Yeah. With some of the things that that's why I'm asking. Um, in the same treatise, Bhakti, I mean Upadesha Amrita, these two points are made in two different verses. Uh, he talks about over endeavor. Mm. Bhakti Vinod Thakur gives commentary on Rupa Goswami's statement of over endeavor. What is that? Achyahara prayasya, prayasya. Prayasya means over endeavor. He says to do devotional service takes very little arrangements. So sometimes we make big, big arrangements in order to perform devotional service. Big, big material arrangements. He, he uses the example just like if you have to distribute books. So you may need to have a 
a vehicle to travel in, you may need some books to distribute, and you may have some plan in order to how to do that. And he said, that, in, that is what we call right endeavor. But then he, then he, he gives an example. I can't remember the example he gives, but he gives examples of what is over endeavor. Um, hmm. When you take a very simple activity and you com complicate it, <laughs> Like, uh, what would be an example of that? A simple activity and that could be done very easily, but you make it so complicated that nobody can figure it out, including you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> or I can think of this one example. Uh, one lady in, I think it was Nellar in India, uh, she wanted to have DD installation in her home. And so she invited practically half the town <laughs> and had this gorgeous arrangement made with so much pomp and, you know, big feasts and so much decorations and so many things to install the DD. And so Prabhupada saw that she really was ostentatious. You know, she just went all this big glamour. Why? Just to impress others. <laughs> so when it came time to install the deity, she asked Prabhupada to do the ceremony. So Prabhupada said, give me a conch shell full of milk. So they did. He poured it on the deity and chanted the Brahma Samhita prayer. One promise me, Chintam, and he pocket the set mashu, kalpa riksha, laksa viteshu, suda beer, a vipali antum, lakshmi sarasya sata sambra, the savior manum, bovinda mari purusham, tamaham the chami. And then he poured the milk off, chanted the, the prayer, and said, Didi is installed. <laughs> And then she said, "What, Swamiji, Swamiji, Didi is installed. <laughs> so Prabhupada just diffused her whole program because she was simply trying to make a big deal out of something that didn't need to be, just to impress others. So sometimes like that, just like... Uh, in order for me to... to uh, to uh, you know, to sweep the floor, I have to read a bunch of books on how best to sweep the floor, <laughs> or I have to go to college to get a degree so I'm more intelligent. That way, I can do better bhakti. <laughs> That's over endeavor. <laughs> you know, sometimes people think material education is needed in order to do spiritual activities. That's an example of over endeavor diverting one's attention away from the actual thing in order to get more facilities for the same thing hmm. over endeavor Prabhupada I mean Prabhupada gave an example how he he conducted this movement He uh, he said, I could have I could have came to the West, and simply sat underneath the tree and chanted Hare Krishna, and that would have been sufficient for me. But how many people would have come? Very few. So I had to make grand display. So I built so many temples, I did so many other projects, in order to track people to Krishna consciousness in, in different. But he said, simply chant Hare Krishna, that's all you need. <laughs> How much endeavor do you need for that? <laughs> you can do that any place, any time. But we make big arrangements because people need that. Otherwise, they're not attracted to simply chanting Hare Krishna. 
So we do the gorgeous deity worship and so many other things to attract people. That's all. But you can worship the deity very simply. So for preaching, sometimes these arrangements are made. But but in essence, Krishna consciousness is really simple. It's really simple. Yes. I thought the microphone was back there. How did it get up here? <laughs> that, was that was a silent question you asked, right? So. You ask later. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Maharaj, uh, in family life, sometimes we ask our children to study nice and get good grades. But one can... Uh, question back saying that how does that relate to Krishna consciousness how it will help him in well we encourage this. if you're going if your children are going to school you, you want them to get good grades if you're doing something material do it the best that you can but in Krishna consciousness it's different you simply try to please Krishna by your endeavor it's not so much the skill you have but it's the desire to please it's different but in the material world, if you're looking for some success there, then you have to perform accordingly. But if you're encouraging your children, yeah, go to school, get good grades, but become a devotee. <laughs> not just get good grades. That's not the success of life. Even if they get good grades, what does it mean? Does it mean they're going to get a job? That doesn't have mean that. Eh? Even if they get a job, that doesn't mean they're going to be happy. But when you're Krishna conscious, you're happy. Yeah, and so we don't dissuade people in the material world to do their material activities in a less, you know, proper way. We encourage expertise wherever you are, but ultimately, uh, if it's if devotional service is not there, then all that's useless. Yeah. I mean, Lord Chaitanya's mother and father were thinking, "Why our son, Vishwarup, he was such a he he went to school and he did so good in school, and then after that he went to." to hear Advaita Charya and he had heard so much from Advaita Charya about Vedanta Sutra and Krishna consciousness and then he took sannyas and left home and now we, we only have one son left and, and he's going the same way he likes school and he's also associated with Advaita Charya we're going to lose our other school son so what they did was they pulled him out of school they took Lord Chaitanya out of school. He liked school. And uh, the neighbors were saying, you're taking your son out of school and he likes school. We can't even get our kids to go to school. They don't like school. <laughs> and Lord Chaitanya decided to change his whole program. And that's, that's a whole class. He just performed mischief. Because they were afraid that if he was too materially successful, that would lead to him taking sannyas and then ultimately giving up. So keep him stupid and that way he'll get married. <laughs> no, <I'm just laughs> that was their idea. <laughs> but <laughs> of course that, that that's not a that was wrong. I'm not saying that's not a principle. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know. Many intelligent people get married. <laughs> and many, many intelligent people don't get married but <laughs> it's both <laughs> many stupid people get married and many stupid people don't get married <laughs> so that's not the criteria <laughs> but that's what they were thinking and they pulled him out of school <laughs> so yeah um, but that was a little bit of a side note that's all 
Yes, question? Hare Krishna. Um, you you kind of already answered the question. A little higher up there. No, not that. The microphone. Oh. <laughs> you kind of already answered the question like multiple times in a couple different ways. Um, but speaking on devotional service. Jai Shri Shri Gornitai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Shri Shri Palad Shri doesn't happen at the beginning, but the process is to, in the execution of devotional service, follow the instructions of the spiritual master. If you do it your own way, thinking that that's the best way, that's an expression of one's ego. But if you follow the instructions of the spiritual master, then you're under the guidance of the spiritual energy. You're not acting out of ego. You're acting simply by the guidance of the spiritual master. So, therefore, there is a way to perform devotional service in every activity. So learn that way, which is given by the spiritual teachers. And if you have a spiritual master you can consult with, then you ask, I have to do this service, well, what is the best way to do this service? How do I avoid, you know, getting personally motivated in the service? Um, one of the ways to free yourself from the ego is not to be attached to the results, be, but to be attached to the endeavor. If you're attached to the results, that means you think you're the doer and you want to enjoy the results. But do it for the sake of Krishna, for the pleasure of the spiritual master, and the results are up to Krishna. We try for the best results, obviously, but uh, if we become elated by good results or unhappy by less than good results, that means we're somewhat motivated by false ego. Do your best and pray to Krishna and get directions from the spiritual teachers and then act like that. That's, that's free from ego. When you were speaking about over endeavoring, um, sometimes I find myself in the past, still do, that um, when I'm trying to do something or trying to plan something, and when I try it, I, I you know I come to a roadblock. I take a step back. You, you come to a roadblock, like it's like it it just doesn't go forward, oh. and then again I try, and then again it's like it it doesn't manifest. And, and I've seen certain, you know, certain times in my life where I've tried like four or five times and then I just give up. I'm like, you know, this is too much waste of time <laughs> because I'm tired of trying. Would that be because over endeavoring and it's just not meant to happen? Well, you're trying to understand whether this is Krishna's desire or not. And sometimes Krishna will indicate that this is not what you should be doing or how you should be doing what you're doing. That's special mercy. But we try our best, and if we run into some obstacles, we try to, you know, continue with our service and go around, get, you know, get through the obstacles. But if you become, you become convinced that actually this is not the service that it's needed, or uh, I'm not doing it in the right way, then you may also. You know, restructure your, the way you're doing it, or maybe not do it at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it's, it's always helpful to get advice in those situations too. Priksha's, Priksha's agreeing with that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I think my my marriage was um, more of a material. I don't think it was so much spiritual. It was definitely material. You know, like I like many years ago, I I tried to go back to school, and each time I tried, it was such a <laughs> headache. And then I tried five times, and and every time I try, I can only go through a semester, and then I'm like done. I'm like dead tired. And each time I try, and then I just gave up. And now when I look back, I'm so glad I gave up because it was exhausting. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, but can you have, I to, see you have to see are you are you endeavoring in the right way too? Maybe that's also that. I can remember one particular incident that happened in Rajpur, near Mayapur, or Jagannathiris, in the temple in Rajpur. Well, one devotee was dressing Jagannath, and he put on one necklace. And he put on the second necklace, put on the third necklace, and he put on the fourth necklace. After he put the fourth one on, it fell off. So he thought, all right. And so he picked it up and he tried to put it on again. And when he put it on again, again, it fell off. And he was about to pick it up and try again, and then he heard a voice. Don't you understand? I don't want that. <laughs> so that was special jug, and I told him, you know, three is enough. <laughs> So sometimes you have to contact super soul and under, try to understand: Am I endeavoring in the right way, or is it this the is this the way I is this service necessary? You know, it takes a little reflection and sometimes a little thoughtfulness to see. But if it's the instructions of the spiritual master, then you can say, well, maybe I just have to approach it in a different way. And, and Marsh, you also uh, mentioned just now that you know when when Krishna doesn't want it to manifest, then it's it's, it's not going to happen. And that special mercy, how can we see that, Marsh? Like, how can we see that? Okay, you know, it's not meant to happen. But how can I see it as Krishna's special mercy when we are trying so hard, many, 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 many times? That takes intelligence. You can either get the intelligence from outside or you can somehow or other try to understand it through your experience. <laughs> Not everything is handed to you in a very philosophical you know, way. Prabhupada basically said that this movement will go on by organization and intelligence. It requires organization and it requires intelligence both for the movement to go on. With the ingredients already there. <laughs> yeah. So there are people who are expert at organizing and there's those who are not. <laughs> We have about three more minutes. Three, four but more if minutes. you're a leader, you always you, you always have to learn how to use resources. A leader means not a leader is not a person who does everything. A leader person is knows how to get everything done. That's the difference. So a leader will use other other sources, even other individuals to get things done. You may not be able to do something just like uh, you know when I get on the computer sometimes I get stuck. So you know if I try to fiddle around with it it probably gets worse. <laughs> then everything is a mess. So I just call somebody who knows about computers and then they know oh yeah all you do is this this and then it's, it's fixed. So using resources to get things done is not necessarily 
it is the way that is which facilitates not only more service for everyone but uh, getting a varieties of things done uh, Krishna doesn't do anything but he does everything through his energies his energies work according to his desire and they they carry out his will but he simply has it's only his will that motivates things he's not actively engaged So there's where the intelligence comes in. So Prabhupada said, if you don't have intelligence, then get some. <laughs> but, but then he qualified that. He said, then ask somebody who does have intelligence. <laughs> so intelligence comes from guru. Intelligence comes from shastra. Like that. These are where you find your intelligence. The words of the guru, the words of the shastras. Questions? We almost okay. Sai, Kishaka. Where's Brenda? Is she here? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I can't recognize everybody because I see there's a little extra covering there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All mercy for the Prabhupada. All glories to you. Um, my question is on detachment. About compassion? Detachment. Detachment. That's a um, good idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, does detachment mean that you have your desire list, like you have no desires, or that you have a desire, but you're willingly and happily surrendering it to Krishna's will? Detachment means you have to be attached to something, at the same time detached from something else. There's no such there is there there's no such thing as pure detachment. Detachment from that which is unwanted, unnecessary, undesirable, and attachment to something that's desirable. <coughs> so attachment and detachment are pretty much two sides of the same coin. You become a de detached from the material activities and you attach to spiritual activities. There are persons who try to become detached from material activities. Sometimes they're called the jnanis. And they don't try to take up, up spiritual activities. And then what happens is, they, again, they fall down into material activities. Because everyone has to act. No one can be, you know, not act. You have to act. And that's the nature of the living being is sentient. He has desires, emotions. And they have, you have to, you can't just do nothing. It's not possible. So detachment facilitates a higher form of attachment. Like that. So that's real detachment. That's Rupa Goswami. What's it at? What is that verse? Um, um, uh, Near Bandi Krishna Sambandi Yukta Vairagya Uchite. What is the first two lines in those? Anashakte visayan yeyitam upayanjite nirbande krishna sambande uktavairagya uchite Rupa Goswami is explaining that uh, just to give up something is not renunciation. But one must take up the positive and give up the negative. That, that is renunciation or that is detachment. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Krishna. All glory to you. Oh, I actually have two questions. But my first question is: uh, you mentioned earlier in the lecture that uh, in the Dhammadarasakam, in the Dhammadarasakam. It says that um, we shouldn't strive, or I don't want liberation uh, in terms of Vaikuntha, and I don't want um, liberation in terms of the higher planetary system. Right. So, uh, and I only want Bhagavad in my heart. So, right. should this be our 
mood um, as as we approach as we grow in Krishna consciousness to attain Krishna prema, or should it be um, to go back to Godhead? What should be our motivation? What should we we be attached? See, to? that question came up just recently. To go back home, back to Godhead, is a, is a very high from a spiritual desire, but it's not the highest. The highest is just to want to serve Krishna for Krishna's pleasure and wherever Krishna puts you. That's the highest. But, if you want to go back home, back to Godhead, that's good. <laughs> we recommend that. Because as Prabhupada writes in the first canto, very few persons want to go back to Godhead. Most people take up spiritual life to improve their material life. And that's for most people. Yeah. If their material life goes down, then they think, well, what is this use of spiritual life? I'm not getting it. Yeah. yeah, there was one lady, she came from India, and she came to... Um, she was a devotee, and she came to the UK as a devotee. She was married. Her husband was transferred in his job to the UK. But after some time, he they uh, he uh, he lost his job, and he couldn't find another job. So she said, "We came here to get a better job, and you know I'm a devotee, and now we lost our job. We don't have any money. We can't pay the bills. What is this Krishna consciousness?" <laughs> she wanted to give up Krishna consciousness. But, you know, Krishna consciousness is not meant to improve your material life. That may, that may also happen by Krishna's arrangement. Krishna says, oh, this devotee is serving so nicely. Well, let me give them something. So Krishna will also reciprocate by making your material life nicer. He does that. But that's up to him. That's not the motivation. That's just simply his reciprocation. But if you think like that, you're thinking, well, Krishna, you know, do you see how much nice service I did? I haven't got that raise yet. <laughs> so why don't you talk to my boss? You can, here's his email address. You can. <laughs> so, yeah. so don't perform devotional service in order to improve material. But if you want to go home, back home, back to Godhead, that, that's that's acceptable. <laughs> that's acceptable in an exemplary way. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful answer, mm -hmm. My second question was regarding um, devotion service, like you just mentioned. And it's what should be our uh, uh, what we're thinking of doing our devotional service while we're doing service? What should we be thinking? How to do the service in the, in the nicest way. Learn the service and learn how to do it in the best possible way. And then we'll offer it to Krishna. And so, yeah. The quality is also an expression of bhakti. It's not necessarily bhakti itself, but it's an expression of bhakti. I'm doing it for Krishna. I mean, Prabhupada was always like that. When you do something for Krishna, it should be done in the nicest way, using the nicest things. If you know, it's just like you go to the temple and you you have a hundred and one dollars in your wallet, and you say, "Krishna, I come to give you a donation," and you give him the dollar, right? <laughs> And you keep the other hundred. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> so the idea is to give the best to Krishna. <laughs> Doesn't mean you give him all your money. It means that you always think, because bhakti begins with sacrifice. If everything is convenient, there's no sacrifice. You know, <laughs> just like charity in Kali Yuga is to give away things you don't want anymore. That's charity in Kali Yuga. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't want this, but I know somebody who might need it, so I'll give it in charity. Just see what I gave you. 
Well, that person may like it very much and appreciate it, but it's something you just didn't want <laughs> or you couldn't use. Real, real charity is to make some sacrifice on the personal level to please someone with the object that you offer. That's real charity. So when you give your time, you give your energy, your intelligence in service, that is, that's, that's the elements of bhakti. Yeah. And if you stay in devotional service, Krishna will test you. He'll test you to see, you'll, you, you'll be face to face to choose between what you like and what Krishna likes. And you'll, you have to make that decision. If you choose Krishna, you make advancement. Because Krishna wants you to become purified, so he gives you challenges. And these challenges are good for our advancement in devotional service. Thank you very much, Mahad. Thank you. Anything else? I think we reached the end. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai, Dhammadarata Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.